Well, good afternoon and welcome to our lunchtime dial-in and um, where our aim is to update you on all of the issues and the latest developments that are affecting churches and charities um, at this time whether you're a treasurer a trustee a church leader or indeed anyone else who's involved in church or charity governance we really hope um, that you find this session really helpful today my name's Jackie Fletcher and I'm head of treasurer services here at stewardship um, I'll be hosting our session today and I will be joined by three of our resident experts, um, Stephen Matthews, who is one of our senior consultants, um, Kevin Russell, our technical and advocacy director, and Lawrence Duplessy, who is head of our accounts examination services. So a particular warm welcome if you're new to stewardship, um, where our vision is for the world to encounter Jesus through the generosity of his church. The purpose of today's dial-in is to strengthen Christian causes, um, to support you in ensuring that your organisation remains compliant and equipped to fulfil the mission that you've been called to. If you'd like to find out more about how we could support your church or your charity, you can check out all of our services and resources on our website. Or do feel free to call our church and charity team and chat to one of our advisors and um, they'd love to hear from you and the number is on your screen now. If you have joined us by phone, um, you should receive the slides by email after the call so you'll receive all of these details later. Now, if you'd like to make sure that you receive that follow up email with all the follow up materials and links to useful documentation. Um, and it does include this podcast recording. So you need to make sure that you're signed up to the dial in mailing list. Um, if you've joined us by some other means and you haven't yet signed up, um, then just email us um, to find out how and we will send you the link and the follow up email. So moving on to our agenda for today, this is what we'll be covering. First of all, we're going to look at what you may have forgotten about gift aid declarations. Um, the Ukraine crisis, generosity, wisdom and the church, giving to overseas ministries and the other side of the coin, receiving funds from overseas or from unusual sources. Um, we'll look at giving confidence to your supporters and a brief update on the Charities Bill 2022. And finally, but by no means least, we'll have our usual Q&A session where you get to ask our panellists your questions. Um, we absolutely invite your participation, so do pop your questions into the chat. The instructions to do so are on the screen now. I can see somebody's already getting in early with a question, which is great. Um, and we did have a couple of you email beforehand, so we will get to all of those questions towards the end of the session. Um, we've got a lot to get through, so let's make a start on our first item. And Kevin is here to bring us a reminder on what you may have forgotten about gift aid declarations. Kevin. Thanks, Jackie. I did write a blog on this important topic last September, and we'll send you a link to that, so there's no need to take notes. Um, so we're all familiar with gift aid, and we just get on with it. Um, but it, it is important to note that there are some specific requirements of the gift aid scheme, some of which are best practice, but some are actually legal requirements. And because over time, recollections can become rusty, they're passed on from person to person as people change. And knowledge can simply become out of date. So let's have a recap of the current requirements. The content required on a declaration. First off, the name of the donor and of the charity or sufficient to identify the charity. And HMRC strongly prefer the full four names of the donor. So it's always advisable to give that particularly if, for example, you have two John Smiths living at the same address. So that brings us on to the second point, the home address of the donor. Note that work addresses and care of addresses are not acceptable. So name of the donor, name of the charity, home address, the identity of the gift or gifts to which it relates. Now the declaration may refer to a single gift, but more commonly to all gifts made after a given date, which can be up to four years previous the so-called enduring declaration. Then confirmation from the donor that their gifts are to be gift aided. And then a warning to the donor. A charity cannot legally reclaim gift aid unless the donor is made aware that if they've not paid sufficient tax, that's income tax or capital gains tax, to cover the tax that will be reclaimed by the charity, 
they themselves will have to make up that difference to HMRC. Now, this last one doesn't have to be in the declaration itself, but the law does actually require that that warning is given to the donor at the time the declaration is given. So it's sensible, really, to include it in the declaration itself. And it follows on from this that it's good practice to periodically check in with donors, perhaps every few years, that their declarations continue to be up to date because things like getting married, having families, loss of job, retiring, and recent increases in the level of personal allowance are all reasons why there may be a change in circumstances such that not enough tax is being paid going forward. And I've even seen a case where someone died and their widow continued their late husband's gift aid giving without supplying a fresh declaration in their own name. So that's the content. What about designing your own gift aid declaration? Well, HMRC have published model forms of declaration which satisfy their requirements, and we'll send out a link to those. But there's nothing to stop a church designing their own, but if they do depart from the model form, they must ensure that their own declaration contains all those minimum details. So much for content. Does a declaration need to be signed and dated by the donor? Well, curiously, there's no legal requirement for either. However, our view would be that it's advisable to ask donors to do both as a matter of best practice, because that will help evidence that they did in fact agree to their donations being gift aided, and the date may help establish which donations the declaration applies to. Does the declaration need to be in writing? Well, in strict legal terms, a declaration can be given in writing or orally or by written or oral methods of electronic communication, such as by email, text or voice message. However, where a declaration is given orally or by digital communication, charities need to be mindful of the need to provide what HMRC refer to as an auditable record of the declaration. And they give examples of acceptable forms of auditable record in their guidance. And we'll give you a link to that. Um, that also appears in my blog, incidentally. What about joint giving between husband and wife? Well, it's possible for spouses and interestingly, other persons living together to make a joint declaration on the same form. Though in effect, there are two gift aid declarations in the one. The joint declaration must include the full name and address of each person and ideally should be signed by both to prevent any later dispute. However, it may be better for the parties to each make their own separate declarations. This is because where a joint declaration is made, both parties will need to make clear to the charity involved how much of any one donation relates to each of them. And strictly, this split should be capable of being backed up by the funding into any joint bank account that in turn funds the donations, and that reflects each donor's own tax affairs. Further, when the charity receives a joint declaration, they must make a separate claim for each donor in the right amounts. So that's joint declarations. When can a declaration be given? Well, as I've already hinted, it can be given at any time in advance of the donation, at the time of the donation, or any time after making the donation, subject to the normal four-year time limit for a charity to make a gift aid claim. And it's worth noting that the time limit works slightly differently for charitable trusts as opposed to incorporated charities, and that includes CIOs. And you can read more on that in our briefing paper called Gift Aid Claims and Declarations, which we'll send you details to as of, sorry, at the end of the call. So how long must declarations be kept? Care's needed here because it may be necessary to retain an auditable record of an individual's gift aid declaration for a long period of time, where they're both, where they're a regular donor to the church. The time limit for retaining declarations or an auditable record of them is six years, note six years rather than four as may be expected, from the end of the tax year in which the last donation was made. So let's have a look at a quick example. Jacob has been a leading member of the church for many years, but moves on to be nearer to his grown up children at the beginning of 2016. He made his last gift aid donation to the church on the 7th of April 2016, so over six years ago. At the end of the tax year of that last donation is the 5th of April 2017. Therefore, his declaration or an auditable record of it must be retained at least until 5th of April next year, 2023. And that's 
pretty much seven years after the last gift aided donation. And don't forget to check our link on HMRC's guidance on what kind of records are acceptable. So finally, just to remind you that gift aid declarations contain personal data. Don't forget that the church has a legal responsibility to securely look after that data and to retain it for no longer than is strictly necessary. So not only do you need to look after the security of the data, but be ready to delete or destroy it once the retention period specified by HMRC has elapsed. And of course, that is something that's easy to overlook up to seven years after the donor has moved on, as it were. So it should be part of your regular data protection checklist procedures. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and if all that seems a bit daunting, then Stewardship do offer a church and charity account whereby we handle all of the giving to your church or charity along with the associated gift aid. And if you are interested, um, just chat and call to our team who'd love to discuss your needs with you. Um, right, let's move on. Next, we're going to go to Stephen, who's going to share some thoughts on generosity, wisdom and the church in the light of the continuing Ukraine crisis. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the response of the church and Christians in general to the war in Ukraine has been an outpouring of support in prayer and a desire to help practically. At Stewardship, we've seen around about £2 million in financial support for charities working in the area and know of many churches taking up special offerings to do their bit. We had a conversation with a Christian ministry whose support for work in Ukraine had rocketed from under £20,000 in a year to over £40,000 in the first four weeks of the crisis. And this is only a small element of the river of generosity that is flowing. As the war heads towards its fifth month, it's clear this crisis is not going to be over quickly. Whatever happens on the battlefield and negotiating rooms, there will be a massive need to support Ukrainians for a long while to come. This means that a long-term view is needed to manage the river of generosity so that it does not get poured into leaky buckets. And to mix my metaphors, firstly, there are plenty of sharks out there. And secondly, not all forms of aid are actually helpful on the ground. My aim today is to help churches and Christian charities focus on being wise about how they apply the funds or the goods given to them. So I'm going to give you a number of points to consider. One. How well do you know who you're giving to? Firstly, the regulators are warning about a lot of fraudulent operators out there pretending to be charities wanting your Ukrainian generosity. As I said, there are lots of sharks out there. Secondly, do you know where your recipients are? It makes a lot of difference which part of the Ukraine they are, whether it's in the west of the country, in or near the battle zone, or even in the east, which is controlled by Russian forces. Do you know their circumstances and what the real need is currently? Because it may not be money to buy things. Three, what size of organisation are there and what infrastructure does it have? Some projects are best done by small local groups and some by larger, better resourced ones. Four, are there safeguarding issues in the way things operate? Now, a difficult one. War zones and refugee groups are chaotic places, but we must also be aware that they're potentially places where those that are potentially there to help and protect are not always what we think they are. There are a lot of sharks out there. Five, is money handled well? Or does money leak because there aren't enough people at the other end to administrate it well? Or is it part of what is actually needed extra people to make sure the money is handled well, something to discuss with those you're planning to support. Six, are there others doing the same things in the same place? If so, is it better to support them than to start something new? Seven, is there mutual agreement with the recipients on what the money will be used for? Sometimes givers think it will be used one way, and the receivers use it in a completely different way. Sometimes if it's been given to individuals or church groups or small ministries, the recipients can actually see it as their own personal support and spend it on their own personal living expenses and things like that. Expect to ask for a planned use, maybe in the form of a planned budget. Eight, how are you sure the money is actually getting to the far end? This is particularly the case if various steps are being used to get the money to the end user. 
little note here, it's often wiser to give smaller amounts more frequently than a large chunk into what may be uncertain and fast changing circumstances. Nine, remember that there are sanctions in place. It is possible, especially if funds are being given to areas of Russian or separatist control, that you will have to consider this legally damaging critical issue of sanctions. 10. What feedback are you seeking to obtain on the use of the gifts? This will depend on the use of the funds, but feedback is expected by UK regulators as well as for your own accountability. Albeit remembering that in crisis times, people at the other end may think this secondary. See our paper, A Guide to Churches Giving Overseas, and Lawrence will speak a bit more on this shortly. 11. Is there the documentation that is needed for UK regulation? For example, HMRC have specific requirements when charities give overseas. We'd strongly recommend having some form of written grant, grant agreement. It doesn't have to be a long one, but per having a written agreement which is quite clear can be scanned across so there's quite clear there's agreement for all of this kind of overseas giving or grant making this is a really useful helpful tool 12 where unusual risks are being taken because the crisis demands it have the trustees weighed those risks and assessed and documented the alternatives and choices made we have to remember that sometimes risks need to be taken and in times of crisis and in war zones, risks are greater. An organisation that does nothing involving risk normally does nothing useful at all. But you do have to document why you do things if it's not the normal way. 13. When appealing for money, remember that the terms of the appeal becomes the terms on which the money is held, the restricted fund. It's normally wise to make this wide to allow for changes on what is required. For example, if you look at tier funds, if they have an appeal, they will sp spread, they will explain what will happen if the funds can't be used in the Congo or, or Zaire or uh, Syria or wherever it is. And also have a read of our paper on our website on financial appeals. As the Charity Commission put it, if your charity receives a sudden significant increase in funding to help respond to the crisis in Ukraine, it is important that as trustees, you carefully consider the practical implications for your charity. This is all the more important if you're a smaller charity and the proportionate increase in your funding is very large. The Charity Commission have useful guidance for, this, for charities in this area, which we recommend, and there's details at the end. Remember, that it is possible that a different way of working for you may be required given the types of need and the amounts being given. Also, remember the changing situation and challenges in some cases mean it may be better and faster to give to established charities who've developed strategies for working in their different areas. Stewardship has been busy vetting and assessing ministries and charities working in this uh, and around the Ukraine and with Ukrainian refugees as part of our rapid response work on this crisis. Have a look on our website, which lists the 50 specific charities that we know are working well in this area. The church is called the light of the world. And at this time of darkness and crisis, we're called to share what we have with those in need. Let us do so with radical generosity, but also with wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and we will send out a link to that rapid response page in the follow up email as well. Um, let's move on to our third item today, which is on giving to overseas ministries. Um, and Lawrence is going to give us some practical guidance on the considerations and risks. Um, over to you, Lawrence. Thank you, Jackie. Grant making and supporting missionaries and projects abroad are regular activities for churches and Christian charities. You're probably aware of the need to be careful when uh, sending money abroad. And Stephen has touched on some of the issues already and it may seem like a lot to consider. We now want to look briefly at two principles that can help you decide what a church or charity should do. Now, HMRC and the Charity Commission rightly take a keen interest in grant making or sending money abroad because there are many risks involved of money laundering and fraud on the one hand, 
and just misuse of charitable funds on the other. Uh, it's not as close to home and therefore we're less able to make sure the funds are used properly, especially where other local partners are involved. And regulation is often weaker or non-existent in some parts of the world. It's always worth remembering that what is eminently sensible in one culture may appear really strange in another. And so as churches work with overseas recipients, there is a need to develop a two-way cultural understanding so that the UK church better understands the overseas environment into which it's giving and the overseas recipient better understands the requirement of the UK regulatory framework. Now, two principles can help here. One, know who you're dealing with, and two, adopt a risk-based approach. Firstly, know who you're dealing with. It's very important to know where the money is going and what it is going to be used for. Often recipients are known to a UK church or charity, either through personal connections or referrals. Many of the most effective relationships mirror the gospel partnership relationships we see in the New Testament. But good partnerships can still involve misunderstandings, especially when crossing cultures. And we're also seeing more requirements from HMRC for formal documentation, even with long-standing relationships. The level of due diligence will also depend on the size of the grant, depending on the level of engagement. Uh, might include a combination of requests for governing documents of the recipients, grant applications, and trustee or equivalent identification, or even personal visits where possible. Secondly, adopt a risk-based approach to all of these measures. This is largely about common sense, although some might argue common sense is not all that common. But factors which could indicate a higher level of risk and therefore more due diligence and precautions include some of the following. The donor or the beneficiary have a new or a distant relationship with the church. The jurisdiction into which, uh, in which the beneficiary operates is prone to corruption or has a less developed regulatory framework than the UK. The size of the donation is significant or increasing over time. What worked at the beginning might not be sufficient now. A regular gift approved by the trustee some time ago has not been reviewed for some time. Gifts being made overseas for general rather than specific purposes it is more difficult to demonstrate to UK regulators that these funds were used for charitable purposes when it is not made for a specific purpose. So key questions for the trustees to ask before the grant is made are what particular charitable purpose it is intended for. And after the grant has been made, how it was actually used for those charitable purposes. What do you need to demonstrate you made sure? Now, one way to take care of giving abroad safely through trusted channels could be through stewardship's church and charity giving account uh, or our relationship with Trustbridge International uh, and more info on that will be in the email afterwards. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, and this is slightly connected to our next item, um, which is also from Lawrence, and this is on receiving funds from overseas um, or additionally from unusual sources. <laughs> Lawrence, back to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, in general, I think we instinctively appreciate there is a risk in sending money abroad, and we take steps to address that risk. But have you thought about the risks of receiving money from other countries, or large amounts from donors you don't know that well? Just saying thank you would be an incomplete and unwise response. Since 2018, the Charity Commission requires charities to report the countries they've received funds from as part of their annual return. Now, for charities with income over £25,000, they have to report the source of all gifts larger than £25,000. Trustees have a legal duty to have controls and oversight over the funds received. And they have a duty of care to donors, for example, being sure that donors can afford to make these donations to the charity. Now, a cautionary tale. Now, all of this may sound far-fetched for churches and small charities. However, we know of one church leader from the UK who, when on a preaching tour in Central America, 
was approached by an unknown couple with the offer of a gift to the church of $100,000, with $20,000 to be retained by the church and the remainder being given on to a named project, in inverted commas, abroad. Now, unsurprisingly, the advice to the leader was don't touch this with a barge pole. Given money launderers will happily pay 20% or more to turn dirty money into a clean income. It's a cost of doing business for them. This might all feel overwhelming, but many of the questions to ask are in fact the same as for sending money abroad, just in reverse. Uh, and helpfully, the Charity Commission has, as part of their general compliance toolkit, and we'll send a link to that after this call, uh, a helpful checklist for trustees when considering the risks of money received from abroad. Among the questions to ask are, do you know your donor and the source of the funds? And we might add, are the trustees satisfied the source of the funds is not morally or ethically dubious? Is there pressure on the trustees to apply the funds in a certain way? That could indicate a money laundering risk or perhaps be outside of the charity's charitable purposes. Have the funds been received through proper channels? For example, not cash in a brown paper bag, but via the formal banking system. Is the donor or the country of origin subject to sanctions or anti-money laundering regulations? Is there any expectation that the charity might have to repay the funds in future or have some other sort of moral or future obligation as a result of this gift? Again, a risk-based approach is useful. You don't need a full-time compliance officer now because you occasionally get a gift from the United States. These questions are also applicable, not just for gifts or grants from other countries, but when you receive large gifts from UK donors who you are not already familiar with. Now the Charity Commission's toolkit, um, which we'll send a link to, has other helpful tools, uh, such as for using intermediaries or other charities to transfer funds or when a large amount of cash is involved. And lastly, having a donations policy which says when you may refuse a donation, as counterintuitive as such a thing feels, is also very useful. Generally, charities must accept gifts unless they can show those gifts will be harmful to them. For example, a, a Christian charity receiving funds from gambling or prostitution could argue their reputation will be damaged. And we'll send more information on all of this in the resources after the call. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, some really helpful pointers there. Now, don't forget that if you have questions as we go through the call, do be typing them into the chat. Thank you to those of you who've already done so. Um, but let's move on with a couple of our last few items. We've got two more, one from Stephen, and Stephen is going to talk about giving confidence to your supporters. Thank you, yeah. In his second recorded letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul uses this phrase, for God loves a cheerful giver. We all love those that are cheerful, especially when they're cheerful about giving something to us. Those that give to our churches, ministries and charities are a wonderful asset, the lifeblood of our organisations without which we could not function. Their selfless sacrifice enables us to do the work we want to do and often pay for our salaries as well. So how do we make them as cheerful as possible in doing that? With our role as church leader, a charity CEO, a fundraiser or treasurer, we want to be those who help people give to us. And so it's very helpful if we can help them be as happy as they can in just doing that. Today, I want to cover some principles which will help us help them. We've talked before about the triple A rating that we refer to that make churches and charities good with money. That rating comes from three ways that are critical to success that all start with A, attitude, accountability and administration. When we have these three operating effectively in our organization, then we should be a good organization to give to. Let's start with the first one, attitude. Some time ago, we undertook some qualitative research among church groups over giving to the church. One group interviewed by us caught us by surprise. So when asked about giving generously to their own church, the answer could be summarized roughly as, you must be joking. The attitude of leaders stinks. They only talk about money when they want it for themselves. Give us one to know that the organisation is a good steward of the money given to it. A steward is not the owner. They know they're holding it for someone else. 
This is shown in the way that the organization and its leaders talk about money and those giving it. Language is a very powerful thing. Proverbs 18 says the tongue has the power of life and death and those that love it will eat its fruit. When and how we talk about money does matter. But it's not only about money, it's how we talk about other people and organizations and what we say on social media. Are we supportive and positive or often critical and negative? Most impactful is how we see those that give us money. Do we recognize their sacrifice in giving to us? see them as gospel partners? Or are we displaying a sense of entitlement and see our supporters as walking wallets? In my mind, we do better when we do not think of fundraising, but of partner raising. We're raising up partners in our ministry, not just obtaining their money. Remember what Jesus said when you watch people giving. The widow who gave a mite, a tiny financial amount, was the one he said gave, gave the most. This is important. Two, accountability. When Billy Graham, the well-known evangelist, set up his ministry, he said this, financial accountability will be our first priority. This was wise. He knew money messed up ministries. Accountability is important to supporters. It knocks on into transparency. Enabling givers to see what they give is in a good environment and how it's being used. Accountability has many aspects. It's both individual and corporate. As individual, our accountability protects us and enables us to be teachable, which is actually a much more important thing than most of us think. And as organizations, we demonstrate by accountability that we're good stewards of the resources given to us. It builds trust in those with whom we work practically includes a number of things, creating a culture of challenge, where there's sharing information and openness to questions. In demonstrating conflicts of interest are being managed, nobody dominates. In reporting back to supporters and other stakeholders and investing in the ministry's public accounts. Now, churches are different from most charities in having a closer, more involved bond with the majority of their givers. And what works for a publicly funded charity will be different from a church with a strong family feel. Now, I'm going to say more on the accounts aspects. Financial reporting may seem boring, almost irrelevant. However, it says something about the organisation. It shows how much the organisation values accountability in explaining well what it does, why, how it does it and how its finances work. The public accounts also give a message together with the trustees report. They tell a story of our work. They show efficiency or lack of it. Shows regard for regulators, Romans 13 says that's a good and important thing. And it also shows the quality of ex external advisors and reviewers that we selected. It is not just a hygiene fact, but speaks of kingdom values. Now, for closely involved supporters, e.g. church members, it is best to provide more detailed information than just the public accounts. And nearly always, comparisons with budgets and budgets for the forthcoming period are a very useful tool to link vision and their support. But these accounts and financial admin is not just hygiene. It speaks of kingdom values. It is strategically important. Thirdly, admin, administration. The Apostle Paul in the context of handling finance talked about, we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of God, but also of men. Or in the ESV translation, we aim at what is honourable. This speaks of intentional planning on finance. Having good administration to handle supporters' generosity is a vital element of good management. At stewardship, we more often than we'd like to see the generosity of people of God being poured into leaky buckets with a loss of finance, motivation and reputation that follows. It's important to show supporters that you have in place well-planned systems so the bucket into which their money goes is not leaky. If they think our administration is good, then it gives them confidence to give. If they think it is bad, that does the opposite. It is part of doing what is right. Part of this is to have a finance team not just a treasurer, a 
team because there is such strength and health in having a finance team and not just one person handling finance. This is a critical aspect to develop and to demonstrate. Paul did this with the Corinthians, making sure they understood that he was sending a team of brothers to administer this generous gift to honour the Lord. Actually, they weren't just any old brothers. These were important strategic guys in the church. Another is the relationship with the supporter. A prompt acknowledgement of gifts is valuable. A third often overlooked area is a wider sense of the charity's governance. This is seen in such issues as a charity regulars website about your own charity. It shows whether statutory returns are up to date. And it's surprising when we look at churches and Christian charities, how many are not. This also shows what policies are in place, whether trustees are paid, and the other elements that give a picture of how well administered it is. Let's learn from the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 show Paul talking about money, challenging, inspiring, reassuring. But he was also aiming to give confidence to the church as they were exhorted to give to the needs of others. Our organisations depend upon our supporters. Let us plan to do what we can to give them confidence that their money given to us will be well used. We want them to be cheerful or even hilarious in their giving, not just for our sake, but because God loves it when they are. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will send out a link to another of our free resources, the Financial Health Check, um, at the end, which really can help in the area of giving confidence to your supporters. Um, finally, we have a brief item from Kevin, who is going to give us an update on the Charities Bill. Kevin, thank you. Yeah, thanks. We thought it'd be useful to wrap up today with a very brief update on where things with the bill are. Um, th that applies to England and Wales. The good news is that the bill received royal assent in February and therefore has passed into law as an act. However, the Charity Commission do need some time to amend their guidance and procedures, etc. So the various provisions of the act um, will come in in phases over the next 18 months. So we'll bring you more detailed analysis of each of the changes to the law as they affect churches during the course of that implementation. But for now, I just wanted to give you a brief heads up of when to expect particular provisions that may be of interest to you to come into force. And I think the most helpful way to do that is to group them by timeline. So the first provisions of the Act are expected to come into force this autumn, and they include simplification of the failed appeals regulations. That is what happens when funds are raised that cannot be applied for the purposes that the funds were raised and associated with that powers to apply funds to similar purposes, known as the See Pray Doctrine. Secondly, simplification in relation to the power to make ex gratia payments. And thirdly, widening of the statutory power to allow trustees to supply both goods as well as services to their charity. The next set of provisions will come into force, we hope, in spring 2023. And these include a simplified definition of permanent endowment, as well as amending powers to borrow from or release permanent endowment. Secondly, amendments to the rules relating to the sale or mortgaging of charity land, including an expansion of who can provide a report to the trustees under those rules. And finally, for spring 23, changes around powers of the Charity Commission to regulate legal and working names of charities. And then the final remaining provisions will come into force in autumn 2023, all being well. And that is additional powers and flexibility to change a charity's governing document, particularly around purposes, power conferred on the Charity Commission to order a charity or to authorise payment of remuneration to a charity trustee for work already done. And that's so-called equitable relief. And finally, technical changes to the law supporting charity mergers, in particular to protect a charity's rights to a legacy where the old charity has ceased to exist as a result of a merger and the actual legacy arises after that merger. As I say, we'll cover some of these topics in more detail closer to the time. If you have particular questions related to that, the act that you'd like addressed, please do email those into us and we'll do what we can to address them either in a future dialing or in one of our blogs or briefing papers. Thank you. 
Excellent, thank you, Kevin. And we will look forward to hearing more on that in future events. Um, so that brings us to the end of our agenda for today. Um, before we move on to your questions, I'd just like to highlight a couple of the other ways that we may be able to help you. Um, firstly, we offer training for trustees specifically designed for Christian churches and charities, it covers all of the main areas of responsibility um, and helpfully highlights the common pitfalls that occur in faith charities. And it comes highly recommended. So if you're a trustee and you've never been on any training or if it's been a while and you'd like a refresher I can definitely recommend it to you. Um, another service that may be of interest is our consultancy helpline. Um, for a very affordable annual subscription you have access to professional consultants um, who can answer your questions on a range of topics including accounting, employment, charity law, several other areas as well. So details of this service and how you can sign up if that's of interest to you will be in the follow-up email. Um, and don't forget to bookmark our dedicated resource hub on our website. Here you can find all of the free briefing papers and other resources, um, including template policies, for example. Um, finally, something new, um, following on from Stephen's slot on developing cheerful givers, we're going to be trialling a new course in the autumn on raising funds for your Christian ministry. Um, it's aimed at helping you to maximise your giving income. Um, did you know? For example, that the Bible contains a wealth of rich insights about fundraising and supporter care. As Stephen mentioned, it's actually more than just fundraising, it's partner raising. Um, so if you'd like to find out more about the biblical principles in the area of raising funds, um, along with some practical guidance on how to plan your strategy and communicate with your supporters, this course is definitely for your organisation. So if you'd like more details, please get in touch just to register your interest and we can send you more details nearer the time. Okay, let's move on now to our question 